What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Keith and Mike Watch Deep Space Nine. Today we are talking about Season 3, Episode 16, Profit Motive, something we have never had. Mike, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing all right, Keith. Uh, yeah, the, the, the big reveal is in the title of the episode. And, uh, yeah, it sure is. Yeah, unfortunately, it, it comes much sooner in our episode than it does in the show. But I guess. Well, only if you're paying attention to the spelling, which I never did in the 90s. So No, in fact, you know, since I have to look up, I don't have to. Since I choose to look up what other shows were airing on this date, I'm mm -hmm. actually paying more attention to, to episode titles than I ever have before. And I recognize that a lot of people attempted their cleverness in the actual episode titles. Yeah. And it's lost on most folks, I think. Yeah, it, it sure is. Well, I mean, look, you know, you you... We writers are just trying to amuse, you know, ourselves and each other, right? Mm -hmm. We gotta yes. come up with something. Gotta come up with something clever. I guess. So. Uh, you know. So, uh, so there it is. But uh, while we talk about clever titles, we have to talk about last week's episode, mm -hmm. Heart of Stone, and give your ratings uh, before we can determine who was the winner between Mike and I. Which is important. Uh, tremendously important. So here is what you said. If you would like to leave your ratings, just leave your rating in the comments below about this episode and we will read it next episode. You see, it's a, it's a whole complicated system we got going there. So last week, Joshua Cronin gave it a 92. Jason Moe gave it a 77. YouTube viewer gave it a 75. Delusions at Noon with a 79. JD came in high at an 86. Worf's boot shivs at a 75. And Harry Pothead as well with a 75. But with the super tip, as always, that's how you get your comment read on the air. You leave a super tip down below. Below our Just buddy the super tip. I've been waiting to make that joke. I don't know why I haven't done it before. Oh, and it was so worth it. You can't get pregnant if it's just a super tip, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Can't get pregnant on the internet. Okay, well, our friend Sans Deity, of course, left this. Uh, interesting. As a self-avowed atheist, shocking that somebody named Sans Deity is an atheist. I know. Yeah, me too. The religious aspects of DS9 can sometimes be irksome for me. Hmm. For example, the prophecy in this episode only comes true, like all prophecies that come true, in quotation marks, because the interpretation is changed after the facts come out. 100%. DS9 does a great job with religion overall because it's never overtly preachy or uh, and the metaphysical religious aspects are born from the real beings as the prophets do exist. So it's not 100% just corporeal beings being shoehorning their religious beliefs into facts. I feel exactly the same way. That's why as I was saying last week, that's why I really like how Deep Space Nine handles it. Uh, he continues, uh, religious discussion aside, I'm not a huge fan of this episode. It's predictable, and no performances stand out even to save it. Say what you will about life support, for example. At least it has Nana Visitor's amazing performance in it. There's uh, This one is just there to me. You know that the prophecy is going to come true in some form, and all the doubters will be proven wrong. I wish that there were more examples in fiction overall where the skeptic is the one who is proven right, not the believer, since that's far more true to life. That's also really fair. One saving grace is the common theme I'm noticing on my rewatch. Even in the bad episodes, there are important moments to the show. This is another one that takes Cisco further along his journey as the emissary and adds an important texture to the series, so I can't completely hate it. So it's 50 self-sealing, hell yes, they're self-sealing stem bolts from me, just right down the middle. It's also pretty cool that two random 90s movies you were discussing on this show, Dave and Sister Act 2 are the first two movies I ever watched when I finally got cable in the 90s. Hey. So they always have a special place in my heart. I just watched Sister Act 2 with my kids, so it was pretty cool. It showed up this week in the episode. When I'm Jesus wished! Oh my lord. We're gonna go I, back to that well a few times. I, I, I will have you know, I'm using monitors right so nothing that i'm that's that's coming from you is is playing out loud in the basement here but when you did that the cat went well there you know so it was so loud it came through my monitors 
Uh, how bad is your hearing that you jacked me so loud? Uh, bad. <laughs> <laughs> You would, I mean, look, it, not only are we doing all of these shows, but I'm recording my demos and all of my, uh, you know, the album, whatever I'm working on, which means I'm screaming like 17 layers yeah. of high notes into this, which in order to, I have to, it's terrible. I, I, um, not good, not good. Anyway, uh, let us hear from our last adjudicator of last episode from, from the, the desk of Chancellor Jen. Here we go. Spoiler alert. Chancellor Jen loved it. Colum Meany was amazing, and I love the Cardassian scientists. I agree with Keith that my favorite scene was Kira and Cisco when she tells him she believes he is the emissary. They are so, so good. Jen, did you watch our episode? Yes. She, Keith, oh. it's it's beyond the pale. Now, what's very... What, 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 hold on. I, I hate to air my marital grievances on the internet for everyone. Oh, that'd be a first. But I'm noticing something here. Mm -hmm. I'm noticing that A, she agrees with you a lot. No, B, obviously. she's watching us talk mm -hmm. about the episode. But mm -hmm. twice now when I've asked her if she wants to watch the episode with me, like we promised the patrons we would do this season, she's uh -huh. busy or just flat says no. I think because she wants the episode wants to watch the episode with me. So maybe we I'm need to cool do, start a, the, at a, another patron tier. Keith and Jen watch Keith and Jen <laughs> Keith Face Nine while Mike mopes in the other bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> because Keith and Jen like each other way more than we like so you. So much That's more compatible. So much more compatible. <laughs> All right. Uh, she continues. 92 stem bolts from Chancellor Jen. That's absurd. It just wasn't that good an episode. I'm with Sam on this one. Mike singing when Jesus washed with the chipmunk filter 100. So look, see, All right. she, I she was likes... acting a fool last night. I Maybe I'll post it on the... Th I just was Oh, like, she sent me a video. I saw I you acting like a fool. I was feeling it. And whereas I think 90% of the population of this planet would tell me to shut the up because it was a mm -hmm. Monday night. She thought it was hysterical and was recording it, and I was like, "Well, okay, I still got it." Yeah, yeah. Well, I, it's a it's a, it's a fun video. I I didn't respond because I was doing my D and D, but no, uh, it was a uh, everything I, about the last thirty seconds of things we said. <laughs> or... <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can watch me every Monday night on Broadway Hit Points, streaming live on Twitch, and then posted to YouTube later. All right, so uh, so there we go. So the average rating. For everybody else, was a 76.125. Both of us came in hotter than that. And uh, that makes you the winner closest mm -hmm. at 87. Congratulations, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much. What are you going to do with all your winnings? Uh, I'm going to play a fake applause. Okay. Very good. All right. So what do you say we talk about profit motive? Let's do it. All right. So this episode aired on February 20th, 1995. The top song, I can't wait to hear this one, Mike, right here in my monitors was Take a Bow. Madonna's the, Take a Bow. The something's over, take a bow. That's all I remember about that one. It was like one of, her, one of her rare ballads. That's I. I'm amazed you remember that much. I I watched the video. I'm like I have no concept. This something's over. Take a bow. Right? Something like that. So I think it was yes. That was about right. Yeah. I I don't remember it even though I watched it yesterday. Uh, speaking of things I don't remember because it was a little bit out of my time. The top movie was the Brady Bunch movie. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. That was one of the. That was I remember it being clever because. They made it a, a hard spoof. It was a hard spoof movie, and that that was could have been controversial, Keith. But I remember seeing that in the theaters and thinking it was okay. You saw it in the theaters. I did. Did yeah. you watch the original Brady Bunch? I have watched a lot of the Brady Bunch. I don't know if I did at the time, but in, subsequently, I think I've mentioned. Why this did you the watch the movie if you hadn't seen the show? I think I watched enough of it. I went to the movies a lot. I, I my friends and I we were big into going to the movies. I liked popcorn, and I liked well, I mean, getting out of my house. But I'm doesn't? big on classic television. I find a lot of uh, my comedic, my perf comedic performance sensibilities come a lot from that. Uh, but a little older, like your Lucy's, your Sid Caesar's show of shows, mm -hmm. your 
Brady Bunch and things like that. That kind of, uh, you know, I liked it. It was such an interesting concept to not use the original cast. Well, they were pretty old at that point. I think there's some cameos in there, maybe, but I would think, yeah. So it was it was like the uh, it was like the Abrams Star Trek, not mm-hmm. the original Star Trek. Anyway, interesting. Uh, we weren't watching Brady Bunch on television. We were in the theaters, but we were watching something else on television, Mike. Yeah, you know, Keith, it's just another week on the tu- on the boob tube. But uh, mm. we, you know, Coach was still holding it down on ABC. Their movie that night was Falling from the Sky, Flight 174. Oh, no. Yeah, and then there was a another show at 8.30. I love when we come across sitcoms that took a swing and apparently were a miss because I don't remember even their existence. There was an ABC sitcom at 8.30, so they used Coach as the lead, and they were trying out a new mm-hmm. show called A Whole New Ball Game. And a the, Whole New Ball Game. And the title of this episode... Speaking of episode titles, was Horace Morgan is dead and living in Milwaukee. No, uh, so, I mean, so that's a show. Honestly, that title makes me like I'd I'd watch that episode. Keith, is it I'd worth? Is it worth it? Give it a wiki. Give it a look. Who? who, uh, who what was that show all about? Let's. let's well, find what was out. the show called? It was called A Whole New Ball Game. I'm guessing it's a baseball thing. Oh, hold on. I mean. Why did I go to Wiki? I, I'm an IMDb person. You do person. your thing. Uh, while you're looking that up, CBS had yeah. the nanny, Dave's World, Murphy Brown, and Sybil and Chicago Hope all new. So that was a killer oh, night on Corbin CBS. Corbin and Oh, we've looked this up before. During oh, during the practice stuff? No, I think we've done it on this show. It's Corbin Burnson, Richard Kind, uh, John yeah. O'Hurley, mm-hmm. Julia Campbell. Remember we talked about yep. Somewhere, somehow, we talked about this. Fox was rocking Melrose Place, Models, Inc. Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, brand new episode. Will is from Mars. Blossom was a mind with a heart of its own. And then the uh, movie of the night over on NBC was A Woman of Independent Means, part two. Ooh. Ooh. And then, of course, Keith, UPN, bring in the big hits. Star Trek Voyager, Eye of the Needle, Platypus right. Man, and the show Pigsty. Five cards. No stud, which has a rating of 2.7. Wow, which uh, now is a pretty good rating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There wasn't as much <laughs> I mean, to watch back then. No, there was not. Yeah, I the needle in the segment. What was Voyager doing? Uh, excellent episode. I think one of the best first season episodes oh. of Voyager. All right. Uh, really cool. Yeah. There's a there's a there's a whole there's hope. There's a twist. It's good stuff. All right. Speaking of hope and a twist, on our weekly world news headline, we've got some we've got some sad news, Mike. The oh. Loch Ness monster is dead. Oh, Hundreds man. watch as a prehistoric creature beaches itself like a whale. Oh, very sad. Sixty-two so sad. feet. Yeah, I know. I'm 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 heartbroken. I don't know why all the people watching are from the fifties, but they are. Yeah, and they <clears throat> they didn't even like give you a. <laughs> They didn't even try. Did they not have drop shadow back then? I don't think they did. Uh, yeah. Also, none of them are looking at the dead. <laughs> like no. literally, nobody in that picture is looking at the Loch Ness monster. Yeah, you'd also expect more people. You know, if a, if a prehistoric animal washed. Well, the you don't know foot. if you zoomed out. There might be more right. more people there. Sixty-two anyway. foot beast was over a thousand years old. They did some carbon dating on its butthole. Yeah, yeah it's very sad. Yeah. Very sad. Well. Okay, well, we're done dating buttholes. Let's talk about who directed this episode. Holy moly, Mike, do you, do, do you remember who directed this episode? Should I know that? You sure as hell Freaks. should. Be- it's Rene Aubergine. Oh, Aubergine. Uh, directing his first episode of Deep Space Nine. He has of one funny scene, so now it makes sense why he gave himself a good little cameo. Right, this episode. and yeah. and, uh, and he's directing his buddy Armin, so... Yeah. Good fun. It is written by Ira Stephen Bear and Robert Hewitt Wolf with a story source from William N. Stape, who also contributed to the episode Homeward on Next Generation. What do you say we find ourselves some trivial trivia? Now, Keith, waste your time with trivial trivia. Okay, we've got a couple of interesting things this week. Starting with uh, in the wormhole scenes where we go and hang out with the prophets, uh, Rene worked with the DP to replicate the look from Emissary, but also added a new uh, technique to it, which I thought was very effective. 
And as a Photoshop person, I was like, this is cool. I, I do stuff like this. It's a two shot overlay. So they, they shot everything twice, one in focus and one out of focus and then layer them on top of each other. Um, which is something I do in Photoshop all the time, because like if I if I want to you know shallow the depth of field mm -hmm. in a photograph, I'll I'll d copy the sharp one and then I'll blur the second one and then and just cut out the sharpened part and reveal the blurred parts underneath it, which is kind of what they did here. So it's sort of like a glossy and blur, blur, but you get a little more control over it because you yeah exactly yeah it, it, well right because you you can choose exactly which parts and how much you want to do and you can you can do that as many layers as you want so if you want like a really extreme you, you can do sort of three levels of it anyway it doesn't matter so uh also the carrington award storyline is an inside joke for the writers or the production team because uh next generation was actually nominated for the emmy for best drama in season seven and despite nearly being impossible for a sci-fi show to win, some of the team became convinced somehow that they were going to win. And so they basically huh. just wrote that story in as the Carrington Award idea. Interesting. Well, I'll let it, I'll tease it out whether Mike, Mike's half of the podcast thinks that that inside joke uh, played 28 years later. Uh, yeah, well, that was interesting. You know, the only time I... Uh, won a sort of a big award like that. They told me before the show that I won. Huh. Interesting. Which was, which was, I, I guess because I had to, because because of like the technical stuff, I had to get backstage mm -hmm. ahead of time to accept it. I couldn't come from the house. I often think it'd be better if they tell the people who lost in advance. So just so they don't mm. embarrass themselves by making face on national television. I mean, like you've got to be aware of face discipline once you're when you're on that's television. Fair. That's yeah, that's that's always important. That's face discipline, folks. Mm -hmm. But it's not nothing something we have ever demonstrated here mm -hmm. on this show. Mm -hmm. But um, there it is. So uh, this is the only time in the series we hear uh, Mayhardu's voice. Uh, is that Tiny actor Ron's doing the voice? Actual I was curious. voice. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's Tiny Ron. Uh, but uh, it, it, of course, only as a prophet, because as we learn in this episode, Mayhardu does speak, but only to the Negus. That's how that works. And this this I, I found fascinating, speaking of 70s television, right? The first version of this story, the concept of this, was written as a spec episode by Ira Stephen Bear that he wrote for Taxi. Uh. And uh, and then adapted. It was it was like I I don't know the characters' names, but one of them was like he was going to like this old guy who was the notorious playboy to learn how to like meet ladies. And then when he goes for help, he's like giving it all up. He's renounced it. He's a better person now. Okay. And they're all disappointed. Like so that was the bit. basic. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, what a cast. Good yeah. lord. All right. So that is trivial triva. I think it is now time to uh, hand out some not so trivial thanks to our patrons, Mike. Keith, each and every week we take this time, and though it makes us both uncomfortable, uh, the first half of it where we show gratitude, we enjoy, and then we have to beg a little bit. But first, let me just say thank you to our dear patrons who help bring you this show each and every week. Sounds like an oversell, but it's not. It definitely does help Keith and I offset our time. That's Bryant Kimball. Beersock, Wyatt Eldridge, Casey Clark, Jason Moe, Bren Joshua, Andrew Hayes, Jorge Novoa, and the mysterious Worf's boot shivs, Charles Babbage, Richard Coleman, CRM Productions, Nikolay Ivanovich Lobachevsky, Delusions at Noon. And we have folks who've sent us cool stuff in the mail for various reasons and different shows. J.D. Makes, <laughs> Colin Dagan, Chris Mitchell, CRM. We got Pat, we got Joshua Crone, and you can join that team to get all kinds of fun stuff, watch-alongs, Ask Me Anythings, us playing video games here and there, patreon.com slash K&M. We've got all kinds of fun live stuff prepared and uh, we're going to be doing, and uh, it's so nice to chat with our patrons. Please come along, join the team, patreon.com slash K&M. And I think, because uh, I, I, if I'm up for it, then it's definitely something that we should do. Uh, we've we need to pick a time and a date and maybe we'll get onto the Patreon feed and see what people are available because I think now after 
uh, the episode of Strange New Worlds that we did where we met Cybok. Mm -hmm. I think it might be time for a live patron watch along of Star Trek V. Uh, cool. Which uh, you and I can watch it with the patrons. They can chat along, and we can uh, this we is can a great do idea. that. So this is a great. So idea. we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pick a date. We're gonna announce the date so you can all join if you want to come along on the ridiculous journey that will be mm -hmm. Star Trek V. There are many people who consider it some of the worst Star Trek that's ever been done, but there are other people who will passionately defend Star Trek V. Well, we'll written... grab our beverage of choice with our patrons. A hundred percent. No, we'll no, out. we're definitely drinking. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's a, it, written and directed, Mike, by William Shatner. Oh, I can't. Oh, speaking of Shatner, sorry, quick side note. Y'all, on Fox, and is now available on Hulu as well, there is a show that Shatner hosts called Stars on Mars, Keith, where it's mm -hmm. basically they sequester all of these celebrities. Well, no, there's some. You got Ronda Rousey. You got uh, Lance Armstrong. You got... Um, uh, what's his name? Oh my God! Running back, you know, people, Marsh, Marshawn Lynch. Uh, people who used to do real sports and now just do fake sports. And now they're locked on Mars with Shatner beaming in and giving them missions, and it is so bad it's almost okay. And uh, I mean, I, I I think that is that encapsulates Shatner to the T. <laughs> yep, yeah, it's so bad it's almost okay. So check it out. Uh, I might force you to watch one of those things because it is crazy. Okay, moving on. Okay, so uh, yeah, if you want uh, to be involved in the live viewing of Star Trek V, uh, you better hop on to patreon.com slash K and M. Okay, so our guest stars this week include Max Grodenchik as Rum, Juliana Donald as Emmy, Tiny Ron as Mayhardu, and of course, Wallace Shawn back as Zek, uh, and Bennett Gilroy. Guillory as the medical big shot. I think it's time to hop into the screening room. What do you say? Keith, let's do it. Oh God, my poor cat. Okay, so uh, we're going to begin in our teaser with a very uncomfortable scene because Quark is being uh, given, let's call it ear relief, trying to unload some self-sealing stem bolts, gross, mm -hmm. to an alien lady who actually knows what they are and how to use them and wants them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it all, uh, it's all on the up and up here. And they are about to consummate the deal. Uh, you don't have to be so gentle. When Rom enters in a frenzy, Quark wants no part of it until in comes Mike's mother, Grand Nagus Zek. <laughs> and he's moving in. Thank, probably God like she's, she's, thank God he's covered a little bit more than <laughs> Mom was Guys, on if you haven't seen Strange New Show, you're never going to know what was happening. You're when, still uh, not going to know, even if you watch. You're still not going to know, but yeah. something was happening. You can put it together. I almost fell out of my chair laughing when Mike told me. So, And you can see the moment right there in the episode as the thing that happened happened uh, when I was confused. And now that I know what it was, I've watched it like four times. So don't. And Keith never watches our stuff. I have never watched us, but <laughs> this I had to go back and see. So uh, don't don't miss it. All right. Uh, in Act One, Bashir is called to the wardroom, and everybody celebrates for him. He's been nominated for a Carrington Award. Bashir is confused. But, you know, he's, he's too young for a Carrington Award, but Dax nominated for him. And it turns out he's the youngest ever nominated. And he freaks out and leaves. Uh, you know, this the the, uh, the poor Emmys. The shows never get the acting, and the shows themselves never got uh, Emmy representation. The technical side, tons. But uh, the acting in the shows, eh, it's wrong. Later, Bashir and Dax talk about it. 
for uh, reasons that season one Bashir wouldn't understand, he doesn't want people making a big deal over it because he's sure he won't win. Um, definitely some some. I actually, well, I don't necessarily get really. I didn't get necessarily very invested in the storyline. I did like the development of Bashir from season one. Now he's like, oh, it's not a big deal, but it is. He's just learned to cover it a little bit better. Um, that shows some realistic character development mm -hmm, okay. for Bashir. Sure. Uh, so I was like, I was there. Uh, it's more of a lifetime achievement award. Uh, and uh, he says, put me up for a nomination in 70 years. But Dax continues teasing him about it. Meanwhile, Quark has been staying in Rom's quarters because the Nagus took his and is bummed. He orders some millipede juice, hold the shells, to cheer himself up. The place is trashed. Rom is a slob. And Nog is the one who's supposed to clean it. But Nog is on the homeworld visiting the budget that can't afford him. <laughs> Quark is forced to live here while the Nagus uses Quark's quarters. And, uh, Brothers bunking together, never a good thing. They argue until Quark notices that Rom has been pilfering his stocks. Rom also refuses to follow orders from Quark in his own quarters. Keith, going to interrupt because I meant to yes. mention this earlier and I forgot. Uh, so do you, is there a plot reason why when we mm -hmm. first see the Grand Nagus, they have him hooded and he like shepherds into his his quarters in the teaser before we get to act one? Or is it more plausible that on that shoot day where they had that scene interior, they didn't have Wallace? So they just put him in a hood, they put some extra in a hood and had him sh sh shelter off to Quark's quarters because they, all the because he clearly is on the episode, so. Well, but do we see, doesn't he lift the hood to reveal himself at the end? No. In that scene, there's it's just covered in hood until we get to the scene where where uh, Quark and, really yeah and and Rom. Do we just hear there. the voice? Oh well, then you don't the, even hear the that... voice. You just see his handler, and they're like, "Oh, the Nagus is here." All right, hold on, I'm checking because okay. I'm now super curious about this. Yeah, I have it in my oh. su surprisingly few notes this week, but that's one of the things I learned to. Yeah. All right. Hold on, because it is it is fascinating that we wouldn't see him. Um, but I, I'm sure from a production element, it's exactly, it it was that. If, yeah, we, if no, we saw the hooded person, but we didn't see... They probably had a limited amount of time with him on set. Right. Due to scheduling. And, and that scene was scheduled for a previous day, and so they just shot it without him appearing. Uh -huh. 100%. They obviously didn't have Wallace Shawn. Because mm -hmm. there's absolutely no... Cause, yeah, because I was clearly I was thinking, oh, it's not going to be him. He's been replaced. It's a different person pretending to be him. You know, all these reasons why they wouldn't show him, but none of those things come to pass. No, hundred percent. They yeah. they did not have Wallace that day, so they made it work either way. Good job, Renee. I didn't even notice, but Mike noticed. Mm. What have you done? What have you created? <laughs> well, you know what's terrible now. I actually noticed something this episode that I want to. Uh, pitch to you to maybe ask your uncle. Okay. Because I noticed something I, I think is super cool and maybe a little bit of a a, a retro analog nod, but I'll, I'll mention it when we get there. Well, yeah, I have bad news for you, though. It wasn't him? Because he was on Voyager at this point. Oh. Well, he probably still... Didn't he work... Didn't he do some sort of oversight for this, or no? He was... He was Well, he was supervisory sound on, on Voyager. I don't know if... He, I, I think... They spun off Deep Space, because I mean, he established all of the Deep Space Nine sound. Mm -hmm. They handed it off to establish all of Voyager. I don't know if he had any supervisory role on the show after he'd left it, because he because he's established Next Gen, left for Deep Space Nine, established Jesus Nine, left for Voyager, and then Voyager and Enterprise didn't overlap. So, mm -hmm. um, unclear, but we'll, we'll, I, I, we'll get to the question, and I'll, I will definitely ask. So we also learn here, uh, you know that they, they've 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 got to get their quarters back. They got to get Quark's quarter back, and we learned that Quark and Rom live literally across the hall from each other, um, which I guess makes sense. Part of this is silly because, of course, the Nagus would be able to get nice guest quarters if he wanted, as the head of state of an entire species. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know he could do this. So he's he's moving in with Quark just to bother him, I think. But not because this version of Nagus wouldn't want to bother Quark. No, no, it's it's it's, 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 a, it's a hard wormhole. And also, this version of Nagus wouldn't be so frugal because you can make the argument that if Frank they, they he'd be so frugal that he doesn't want to spend the money on another suite because he's trying to. But it, it's, but it's this the version do, there, there yeah. is no money. They're not going to charge him. Yeah, so this is a this is a put, stick a flag pin it's, in it because it's a it's a wormhole. It's just a silly sitcom contrivance. That's all it is. Yeah, but they don't oh. show it. They don't even show. And I thought we were going to get part with scenes of odd couple esque hijinks between Nagus and Quark, but we don't get that either. We just get him talking. Well, because about it Quark's here. staying with with Rom. Right, it makes no sense. We and we get this one scene. Well, whatever. Whatever, whatever. It's not so. They argue about who should tell the Nagus to get out. It ends up being Rom, of course. He rings the doorbell, and out comes the Nagus, who is delighted to see Rom and Quark. He's super cheerful, and they go into Quark's quarters and find that all of his furniture and possessions are gone. Um, I guess he sold it? I don't know why. He gave them and away? The, gave them away. The and the, uh, the Nagus has been working on a book. The new rules of acquisition, they've been rewritten. Quark smells opportunity until he reads them. They're backwards. The first one is if they want their money back, give, give it, it to them. them. Mayhardu is in tears. So sad. And that is the end of Act 1. And we begin Act 2 with Rom reading more of the progressive rules as Quark despairs. Rule 285, a good deed is its own reward, and Quark almost faints. Quark thinks, of course, it's a test. He looks for a code in the book. It's nothing. And then he tries licking the book. <laughs> Alas, that was funny. I, yeah. I thought both the looking for the code and licking the book was mm -hmm. funny. Uh, Quark thinks it has to be part of some devious plan. So in the, in the short term, let's just play dumb. Later... Quark is still thinking it over when the Nagus comes into the bar and buys everybody a drink on his tab just to make people happy. Look at that screenshot. That's hilarious. Uh, they play <laughs> along. Then the Nagus mentions he's giving up beetle snuff because that's no fun for the beetles. <laughs> a pretty good, Keith. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Uh, then I'm so sorry. That's on the internet. <laughs> then now you have to do do your Nagus at some point today. So then we find out that the <laughs> no. Then we find out the Nagus has interfered with Quark's stem bolt deal. He told the lady that Quark was screwing her and told her where to get them wholesale and tells Quark he should sell them at a fair price, and this is just too much for poor Quark. Later, we see O'Brien and Bashir playing darts in the cargo bay. They realized that the darts were a hell of a lot easier to set up and tear down than the racquetball set. I do love, just a quick mention, that the future element of this is that, oh, when you hit the one spot with the darts, it lights up and keeps score for you. Which is like a toy we've had. For I have always. one. In, I yeah. have one in the in the <laughs> garage right now. Yeah. It's higher tech. It's space darts. Yeah. It's got to be space everything. That's yeah, the whole right. space jammies, space blankets, space yep. darts. Oh come on! It's so much fun. Uh, and uh, so uh, Keiko is away again. Apparently, maybe maybe ran off with Nog and the set for the uh, racquetball. Right. And uh, so O'Brien is making Bashir play constantly. They discuss the Carrington Awards. And O'Brien says, I would vote for you, but you don't stand a chance. And of course, this is a way to get Bashir to suck at darts. So Bashir turns it around and asks, hey, so how long is Keiko going to be gone to make O'Brien suck at darts? Um, I thought it was cute. I mean, like, we've all done that. Uh-huh. Um, and so, and the the darts is going to be a thing. Okay, at least that's nice to know. Yeah, we're we're building. We're building. I, 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 why am I getting the telepathic sense Mike was not a fan of this episode? We'll talk about it. 
Later, there is a flurry of activity in Quark's quarters. Rom and Mehardu are setting up the headquarters for the Ferengi Benevolent Association. Quark continues to be baffled. In Act 3, Quark pulls Rom out, who is now a senior administrator and loving the job. The Nagus is going to mold Rom into an evolved Ferengi. We're moving beyond greed. Rom is delighted, and Quark has been named co-chair of the Benevolent Association. Quark is naturally concerned they're all going to be thrown off the Ferengi Tower of Commerce once folks get wind of his new plan. Which makes sense, actually. I think that's probably a fair anxiety for, for Quark there. I mean, God, look at the faces on Max. That's a, yeah, that's a great... We're up here, and we're going to go down there. And then Rom gets. <laughs> they do have some good beats in this episode. I'll say that you know, as is kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Slapsticky as it's supposed to be. They they commit to it, and so it it's not a disaster. You know, you have to. If there was no, if the commitment level wasn't as high, I think it could have, it could have gotten a little schlocky. Yeah, or more, more so. More so. So, uh, they try to get the neighbor, the Nagus, some help. Because there's something clearly wrong with him. They get him checked out by Bashir, but there's nothing wrong with him. He's in great shape. Quark doesn't buy it and demands more tests, and he taunts Bashir about the Carrington, of course. The Nagus pays Bashir to donate to charity and announces he's going to give a gift to the Bajoran people tomorrow. That's weird. So later, Quark and Rom try to break into the Nagus's shuttle but they're caught by Mehardu, who, instead of busting them, helps them onto the ship. And they discover one of the missing Bajoran orbs. Now something's happening. 29 right. minutes into the episode, this reveal happens. Yeah. So there's only 16 minutes left. We gotta move fast. We gotta move fast. Mm -hmm. So Quark and Rom fight over the orb, and of course it opens. And Quark is thrown into Prophet Vision World. There you go. There's a screenshot for your, uh, for your. There it is. Snap your thumbnail, Keith. <clears throat> so uh, he meets the Nagus in there, who taunts him while zapping in and out all over the station like a lep, like Leprechaun. Remember those movies? The yeah, Leprechaun remember, movies. Yes, hundred yeah. percent. Uh, he tells Quark to make a leap of faith. Which he leaps off of everything. It's, I mean, this reminds me of Pee Wee Herman's Mecca Lecka High, Mecca High Ho. That might be the screenshot yeah. if I can find a way to get the contrast right. Do you remember Mecca Lecka High, Mecca High Ho? Sure, I do. Yeah. I remember Pee Wee. What was the name of that genie, though? It was just Genie, right? Just Genie. Yeah. Yeah. I love that show. Speaking of Photoshop, we got we got to fix the, your corners on your uh, on, on your your. Is that me overlapping? There. Yeah, you're you're overlapping. On your you gotta you gotta crop your corners. I I, I see it every week, and I literally the never mention will, it. Why not? Oh, there we go. Oh feel, my god. You feel better. Oh, my now? life is better. I do. I feel so much better okay. now. That's all I needed to do. You got that? Oh, you're right. Yeah. Now you get the drop shadow of the panel. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's amateur hour over yeah, here. I know, man. It's not like we're flying a SpaceX rocket every week <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> Yes, and it also like bursts into a ball of flame every <laughs> once in a while <laughs> because the guy at the top has gone completely insane. Yes, 100%. Uh, uh, all right, so he tells Quark to make a leap of faith. Quark opens the orb and finds the new rules, and then everybody claps. I don't know what any of this means. I'm not sure it means anything, but it's cool to look at. So back in the real world, Quark has got it figured out. The prophets put all of these ideas into Zek's head. According to Zek's logs, he got the orb from Cardassia, entered the wormhole, and turned around and came back to Deep Space Nine. Now, Keith, before we move forward, I want to point out my question. I'm pretty sure the answer is yes, but when they're doing all the doodads on the ship here, on the Nagus' ship, or in uh, mm -hmm. quarters or whatnot, I'm pretty sure that one of the background sounds that is looping in the background is an old school 26-6 modem going beep boop, beep boop. Oh, I'll have to listen to it, but, yeah. but it, it seems, 
entirely possible. Which I think is a very cool low tech. I, that's what we were rocking at this point. Reuse did, of to make it sound high tech, which is pretty cool. Did we have the 56k at this point, or were we still at the 28.8? Let's see when that came out, because I'm curious. When did 56k baud come out? I feel like it was around now. 1996. Next year. So, so, so we were still at the 28.8 yeah. at this point. Woo-wee. Oh, my goodness. Do you know, Keith, what the BOD stand for? B-A-U-D? Remember, it was like 26-6 BOD. I do not know. Me neither. And, of course, this... See, and this explains why... BOD is on, a unit of me- measurement that denotes symbols per second or number of times per second the modem sends a new signal. That's a ping, basically. Oh. When the term was originally used to mean to measure the rate of electronic pulses, it has also become a way to measure data transmission speeds of dial-up modems. There you go. But uh, it explains why uh, Jim and Sean were mailing VHS su- super tapes. VHS oh. tapes back and forth to Los Angeles because they could not upload the sounds from Vermont. Man. Cr- crazy. Crazy. Uh, all right. So he thinks Zek went into the wormhole, uh, to find the aliens to figure out what, what sentence did I try to write there? He thinks Zek, Zek went into the wormhole aliens to see the figure. He basically, turned- so he wanted to, he yeah. was trying to ask the prophets to tell him the future so he could make some early oh, right, stock future. investments. hundred yeah. percent. Thank you for because you know, I write these fast. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, uh, of course, be, before we get there, because I think that is like an actually interesting thing that he would totally yes. do. How did he get a Bajoran orb from the Cardassians? The Cardassians are not just going to give him that. They're, they're, they deny that they even have any, let yeah, alone. Yeah, they don't actually clear that up, do they? Because like the Cardassians, we know the Bajoran orbs are intensely valuable. They're a huge negotiating piece with the Bajorans. I can't imagine they would just. I think there's only nine of them in existence. He like came it's upon weird it. that he would be able to just grab one. And his um, intention but, was probably to sell it to them. I'm sure. Obviously. Of course. Yeah. And then, yeah. Of course. Um, and then he which, also thought he would blackmail the prophets. I don't or think it just I, happened that it opened, and then he took. He sees the opportunity. It, it op- Yeah. Or some something like that. Or maybe he was like, "Here, I've got this thing. Maybe you'll listen to me now." I don't know. But it makes sense that he would be like, tell me the future so I can exploit yeah. it. Um, but, of course, the wormhole ends are like, nope, and they turned him into a Bernie bro. It's very much, uh, you. All, I often think, you. All, we often think of that like in the Back to the Future vibe, right? Where you go back in time to use mm-hmm. your foreknowledge to make the investments. I think it's a cool little wrinkle of that, of to just let's get the fu- somebody to tell me the future so that I can do it from the present. I, that's a wrinkle, right. that I, a time travel wrinkle that I enjoy. Yeah, I mean, I like it. It makes sense. I, I, I think twenty-seven there, minutes if, into the episode, but if we're rewriting, there's such a so many more interesting ways we could do this. But that's, well, especially know. when, well, and we'll talk more about it. This, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first real time the prophets and their time travel uh, communications has really been shown right we've talked about it a bunch but it's is the first time it's really been a, a central plot mechanic well basically since emissary is this the first time we have heard from the wormhole aliens directly since emissary because it's different than the orbs uh experience yeah and that and that if my, correct me if i'm wrong in that they because i remember kai win being used as kind of like the ventriloquist puppet Right, right, but those those were orb experiences. Oh, that's right, but they're similar, similar, right? It's right, but it's not quite the same. Because thing. inside the wormhole are the actual beings. are the actual alien, the actual being. So this might and be so, the first time we've actually heard from them. I, I since since emissary inside of like a farce episode, which is a bizarre choice, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting. All right, anyway, but so, it's important yeah. and interesting, and I wanted to talk about it. I have a note; just I'll plant the seed now that. The first time we hear from them is adjacent to, or actually it's the week after we sort of started to analyze whether or not their omnipotence is religious or spiritual, or if it just happens to be part and parcel with the type of beings they are, which is, I think, an interesting juxtaposition week to week, week week over week, because 
as I think Sans, Sans brought up, it, it, it's easy to say if, if a being knows the future or is nonlinear time so they can recite the future, does that necessarily make it a deity in some sort of way? Uh, no, I mean, yeah. I, 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 well, and that's, uh, we, uh, we are, we are prone to search to human humanity has always wanted to assign deity to anything we didn't understand. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's just part of the, the human condition. So of course it was a thing we didn't, we, it was, it was more powerful than us. We didn't understand it. So it must be a deity, but I don't think there's any, I don't think they see themselves that way. Yeah, no. In fact, they're quite much more inquisitive than I think a deity would be. Right. They're well, it, it, but it's but it's interesting because they do communicate. They created the orbs, which mm -hmm. do have some sort of communication level. People do communicate with them in some fashion, and they do tell a little bit of the future. But how much intent did they have? Why did they send the orbs out? These are all really good questions. Mm -hmm. um, how they much actually did they remind care? me a lot of what we call agile development in the kind of tech world, which is basically a a much more shortened period of iteration when it comes to tech. So mm. rather than saying, okay, we're gonna beta test something for six months, uh, agile development is we do weekly sprints. So we we fix things week over week in, in shorter periods, see, test, see what's working, see what's not working, iterate very quickly and, and a, a lot or more frequently. And they seem to remind me the, much more of that in this episode where they, are quickly seeing the failings and the incompatibilities or the long-term <laughs> prognosis of, of of societies of beings and say, well, let's fix it. Let's make it better. Let's, you know, which is yeah, what well, they do I, with the Ferengi here, which is interesting. And of course, like if they have nonlinear time, hasn't this already happened? Don't they already know the outcome? Don't they already know? Well, that's an what... interesting thing because they, they, they do make reference in the next scene to, oh, what's the word they use? <laughs> It Re feels like they're making this decision right? in real time. Yeah. Like, it's like when you release an update, right? A Windows update, and they find out, oh, there's a huge security uh, kernel patch in it. So they they downgrade you, right? <laughs> they right. downgrade <laughs> to the previous release. That's sort of what they do here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Beta Zek did yeah. not go well. <laughs> so later, Odo talks to Bashir about the Carringtons. He's heard a rumor that one of the front runners is not going to win. And if it's not going to him, it could be you. And Bashir says, that's nonsense. But of course, he is working on his acceptance speech. I have no idea what's happening. Are they all mocking him? Are they trying to get his uh, competitive juices flowing? What, why is everyone in on this? I don't quite get it. It's the that's whole a really fair. Yeah, they're, they're all, yeah, are they? Because it feels like it they're in? like, no, I, I, I think they're like gently teasing him as a as a way to like Yeah, but he said he wanted no part of it. Are they trying to be like, hey buddy, it's a it's an honor to be nominated? Like let's let's just get pepped up. Let's be feel proud. Uh, well, I mean, let's, let's put it this way. If let's say you're nominated for a Tony. Okay. Okay. Everyone in let's your say life that. let's go ahead and let's say, say that. that. Everybody in your life is gonna be weird about it. Yeah. Right, because it's it's kind of weird. All of a sudden, your buddy's a Tony nominee. So you're like, are you going to win? Buddy, are you going to win? I don't know. This guy, the other guy was pretty good. Or like, but I think you can. Like, no, you're not. You know, it's just like everybody's just weird because they're is, excited about. Is that how people would act? I don't know, but I, I imagine. Well, think about it this way. Well, it starts with right? a party. They threw him a party. And he was like, I'm really weird about this. I don't feel cool about this. And then they spend the rest of the time just kind of like negging well, about it. But, pe but people are weird, right? Well, think about like <laughs> yeah. any of our friends, right? Th think of a friend who was our friend before and then became famous. Okay. And it changes the dynamic of everything. Yeah, okay, that's fair. And now you're like, oh, you're my buddy that I know, but also people are like, think you're famous. I'm like, how do I interact with you? What's the deal? It's it. People act weird. I, I think just people act, I, I, and obviously, zooming out, this was the experience of the people working on Next Gen. Everybody around them became experts on who was going to win the Emmy, and they were just weird and about the whole thing. And so I think they were all just different conversations. They whereas I, had. whereas I don't, and clearly there's a lot of truth to that because it's it's what is right. It's it's documented at this point. From you get the very interesting, 
you get to kind of go back in time and have the me experience, which is like none of that context exists to me until you tell right. me. It does not work. It does not read. It did not work. I had no idea what was happening in this plot. More importantly, I had no idea why it was happening or yeah. how it served any of the characters or the story as a whole. So yeah, I, I, I agree miss. with you. Swing I, and a miss. Well, I agree with you even knowing what the context yeah. is. Like I don't. In fact, like, I'm I, I'm sort of baffled that this made it to air. That they didn't at some yeah. at some point through the edit or the rewrites or whatnot, they were like, we should either scrap it, replace it, or change it. Because I kept or, waiting up until the last second, being like, "How does this play? Like, there's it clearly is leading to something, and it's a what is the why? Yeah, yeah, and, and I I think there would be a way to do this if we had a better sense of the impact it had on Bashir. Like we yeah. see at the end that he's genuinely disappointed after pretending that he wasn't. I think that's interesting. I think that tells us something about about the character. But if there were more of an emotional journey that we saw him wrestling with. Yeah, especially with the context, just spitballing here, why not have a plot where there's some sort of medical emergency or some sort of medical mystery that he's working on in juxtaposition to this award, and at the end, he doesn't win, but he saves this person's life or whatnot, and we show that, hey, awards are bullshit, right? And and don't have any grounding in reality of what your talent or skill right, or competency sure. is. I think I think that's a great story. Or you could even just like have him be wrestling with his own arrogance mm -hmm. from earlier. Be like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed about being 25 and being such a such a dipshit. And if it uh, is people around. are weird, it seems very incongruent that Odo would be weird. Right. It's weird. It's it's funny that Odo would, would yeah. be the one would be the one turning in. You know, but if he's like Oh, you know, I've I, I'm so I, I was this is obnoxious, arrogant guy, but I've I've turned I've learned my lesson. Thank God I'm not that guy anymore. And then you nominated like oh, then yeah. all of a sudden it hops back in, and then he learns that lesson. I don't know. There's a lesson to be learned yeah. here. We just don't choose to do Did, it. I mean, maybe you guys saw something we didn't see, and let me know because yeah. I, I I got nothing from it. But yeah, yeah. So uh, Zach is working hard at a computer to help more people. With a barley shipment. Then Quark, Rom, and Mayhardu abduct him, put him back in the bag, and uh, they carry him through the hallways with Zek in the bag humming merrily, which I thought was funny. They head into the Negus's shuttle, and Rom and Mayhardu. This peace is out. where the modem sounds are. Oh, I think I did hear that. Yeah. Um. Yes, I I I totally did. Now that you're mentioning it. So, in Act 5, Quark flies into the wormhole with Zek. He's still happy and even more annoying than usual. And the shuttle starts to shake. Zek explains they need to open the orb to contact the wormhole aliens. So, of course, Quark does. And Quark goes into the white and sees flashes of his life. Uh, a couple of shots of other episodes, but most of it from this episode. Then the rest of the cast speaks as the prophets as they did an emissary. They ask if the Cisco sent him. He said no. They ask why he's there, and he explains why. And the prophets say they were confused by Zek's desire to see the future before it happened for financial gain, gain because uh, of course Cisco said I don't. We don't want to know what's going to happen. He, uh, so Zek also explained the concept of more being preferable to less. They, of course, found this concept aggressive, adversarial, and dangerous. So they examined the Ferengi existence and found out that the Ferengi weren't always so greedy. Which is cool. So they de-evolved Zek. Quark asks that they re-evolve Zek, but instead they debate doing the same thing to Quark. Then Quark gives a passionate defense of ambition, which he equates with greed, which I think is a bit of a false connection. Um, it doesn't work, right? And I think rewriting it, because you know, what is this about? This is a debate about capitalism, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and the Ferengis being the example of capitalism being run amok. Um, and the point of view of the show and, and aliens and Star Trek to be like, this isn't a good system. But I think that there's an opportunity here for Quark to give a much 
better reasoned, much more interesting defense of capitalism that even if we don't necessarily walk out of it thinking that like, yes, no, that's the way to go. There is some more interesting, more compelling arguments to be made than he makes there. Yeah. And I think it d- it does a disservice to the Ferengi because as they're painted often and as they're shown in this episode, it's about it. The bottom line as it being greed, right? Right. A- acquisition of wealth, wanting more wealth, greed. Whereas that could be that I guess that that services the plot here because ultimately he recognizes the what what the beings want is basically no to interaction with alone. the Ferengis. Yeah, we don't want to right. deal with the Ferengis. And, and, so, and I, I think it would have been such a more of an interesting episode. And and again, writing I said it last week that I really liked writing the characters at the top of their intelligence. Yes, because like, there's clearly Quark, some nuance to the Ferengi motivations. They wouldn't have right. evolved to being that way had there not been some sort of survival tactic. Right, they're, they're written as Darwinian, so greedy to the point yeah. of incompetence, but how do they develop warp drive? Yeah. <laughs> right? And so I think that It would have been cool to learn the Darwinian function of their like, greed, right? Even though I don't necessarily agree with the outcome, mm-hmm. give, me, give me 20 minutes. I can write a pretty good argument for capitalism, let's say. And, and here are the benefits of it. And I think that um, I think that Quark should have made that. And, and what should have turned the wormhole aliens where they're, okay, there is a purpose for this way of thinking. It does, you know, it, it deserves to exist. Maybe it needs some checks, more checks and balances, maybe or whatever. But their point of view is valid. Let's leave them as they are. As opposed to, we're annoying and we're just going to leave you alone. Which is mm-hmm. what they settled on. Um, I, I think the bigger point, right? If you, if the show's point idea is to make an argument against capitalism, it is a much more effective argument. If you dismantle the reasonable, you know, like good arguments for capitalism, then pick it apart, not set up a paper, paper doll defense. Straw man. Straw man, exactly. It it set up a straw man defense that if it was a good defense, then they went at it. That would have been so much more effective and made this episode about something as opposed to the Frankies are annoying. Fair. I I think that's a fair critique. So uh, anyway, so Quark does make the the point. You know, if you keep changing folks, the Frankies are going to keep come back and bother you. Um, Blah, blah, blah. We know this. And he says, make Zek normal and I'll make sure nobody else bothers you. And that is the winning argument. So they beam Quark back and we discover the classic Zek is back. He's going to try to sell the orb to the Bajorans and Quark is happy. Later, in the wardroom, they all watch the Tonys together. They announce the winner and it's not Bashir. They're all bummed. And Dax checks in on Bashir and turns out he's really, really bummed about this. Um... I don't know what we're supposed to take from that because we didn't really write anything about it. <laughs> Zero journal. Um, Zero, just none of it. That is one of the more baffling things that's happened on this show for me. But. He, he, he really wanted it, I guess. I mean, understandably, right? Yeah. Like, as much as we all pretend like it's an honor to be nominated, of course you want to win, <laughs> right? And people, and I mean, and maybe I think, that's what they're saying. Like, you know, you know, it's as silly as much as we know that this is not, we're not generally supposed to win these things. You then get your hopes up. And then you're still disappointed. And, and like know. you know, it's like okay, so you want to you want to write the human story of it shouldn't matter, but it does, mm-hmm. and maybe that's okay. It's understandable, right? Write that episode. Yeah, a lot of episode missed here. Anyway, so uh, at the end, Zek confirms that the revised rules have been destroyed, and the only place they exist is in Rom's head. Quark is bummed; he didn't make any profit out of all of this. But then Rom announces that he embezzled money from the Benevolent Association. Good job, Rom. And that is the end of the episode. Um, the only place they exist are in Rom's head. That's interesting. Maybe that's going to play forward. Mm-hmm. Who knows? I think it is time to move along home and discuss this episode. Oh. Oh. Alright, my 
Mike, what were your wormholes in the plot? Uh, I thought we talked about them a little bit earlier. I think the A story here is um, is where I'm going to spend my time. That or the beast, the 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 Bashir plot is the biggest wormhole it, because it is a hole that leads to nowhere, Keith. Uh, <laughs> just don't know what it's about. I don't know why it's there. I don't know what function it serves. And, and the, the the egregious part of it is that it doesn't, for me, there are ways to make it, um, you had you expounded on earlier, to maybe have it function as some sort of a character developing piece for mm-hmm. somebody. Somebody? But it, yeah. it, it doesn't. The only time that it, there's a couple of moments where he, when he's speaking with Dax where you definitely do see that they have their relationship and their individual characters with each other have changed and blossomed and grown into an actual true friendship instead of just like a hornball uh, volley. That's a trademark. Uh, and also with him and Bashir who have also, or him and O'Brien, is all, mm-hmm. their friendship has also grown and matured. And I think there's a lot of cool nuance they're building with all of that. Save that. I, every time we've tr- you've tried to explain it to me or try to make it make sense, I think you're having to reach a little too far to 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 square peg round hole it even with all the context i think you would agree and so that's my biggest wormhole and also the the machinations of what the negus's plan was how he got the orb Mm -hmm. that actually seems it like it could be an interesting subplot but we don't even discuss it like that seems to be they the Bajorans have either been searching for that or ha- would have been an all-out war because someone has gotten their hands on it who's not sanctioned. So I'm, I'm curious as to what that whole thing was. So those are my two main things. From that and they've, uh, they've mentioned it before on the show that the Cardassians stole orbs, right? And one of the things they were negotiating yeah, early for the show, was, right? was the return of the orbs and the Cardassians, we don't have any. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's actually kind of an important thing that should be treated more seriously than it was. Like, I don't... How the hell did the Nagus get his hand on an orb? Um, or at least make it a story. I think I think it would have been there. So, I mean, I think that honestly is my biggest wormhole. I mean, the rest of it, well, the, you know, the Carrington of it all, it's not that it doesn't make sense. I just don't know why it's on TV. Yeah, it's what I mean for a like, show that's I, I can, so plot based about telling, saying even if it's allegory, it has something to say. There's a why, and I can't parse what this is here. Well, it's like in life, not everything means something, but on TV, it should, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? As opposed to the the writers just sort of talking about their own experience. It it, it was it, it which again, like I get it, right? Great, tell that story. But just find a way to make it about something for our characters, for our heroes. Um, Because otherwise, I think about this in my writing sometimes, right? Whether I'm working on a a screenplay or a play or or a, a scene sometimes, I have to be diligent sometimes about, is this a, a play or is this a therapy exercise? Mm. You know, is, is this for me? Or am I writing something for other people? And they both have value, but I have to sort of keep an eye on it that I'm not just working through my own stuff and that it's it's not really of use to anybody else. Um, I think that's sort of it. Yeah. So I, I, I those are those are my. I don't think I have any new wormholes. Or, my, what was your, or hmm? and in in the best I think of episodes, and this goes across media, across television, the two. The two stories should be complementary, as in together they have something mm-hmm. to say in their juxtaposition or in their character intersections, something. Or is it just two like leftovers that they threw in the microwave because we got we our, our groceries aren't ready? Like it, uh-huh. and I don't I didn't catch that overlap either. So it doesn't really go a with a little you. bit like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, that's that's that. All right. Best moment. You go first. I gotta think. I didn't love a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, Actually, no, I no, mean, no, no, I got something. Okay. I'll, I'll say. One of the things I think that 
there are a couple of character movements that are slow, but they do happen. I'll talk about one of the other ones later. But for this, I want to use Rom. Only a few episodes ago, we had a big breakthrough for Rom through Nog, right? Mm-hmm. And he got a little confidence. I think he got his son gave him confidence. He got confidence that he's doing a good job as a father. I think there was a little bit of movement there. And yep. here, once again, he shows his shrewdness in playing his part as the fool, but also using right. that to garner some acquisition and then mm-hmm. letting Quark know, very secession-y, saying, you know, hey, yeah, just so you know, I, I got some smarts, and then getting that acknowledgement from his brother, maybe there's some... Uh, well, meeting and, ground in the middle there. So, well, it, absolutely. Like he's he's more competent than anybody thinks. Mm-hmm. We're we're definitely sort of telling that story. He's using the fact that everybody's everybody thinks he's a dum dum to his advantage a little bit. But also, I think we saw some genuine interest in this more progressive idea. Uh, yeah, in, that too. In Rob. altruism. Like he was he was sort of like on board, and so it, it it's almost a part of me that wishes he didn't do the embezzlement at the end. Because we're seeing him, like, changing his opinion. He's becoming, he's he's falling a little bit further out of the Ferengi way of thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for me, the, the best moment is is also Rom Quark. I think it's just their, their silly lean of, scene of, of cohabitating with your slob of a brother. Like, we all understand that mm-hmm. scene. Um, and it was, you know, just... Fun. And they gave a little context. It was the first time they've, even in their dialogue in that first scene, they talked about growing up together. And we never really heard much mm-hmm. about that, you know, their childhood. And, and they've been together for a lot. They've been buddies for a while, you know? Yeah. So Yeah. And and you're working for your brother and it's complicated. Do we complicated. know who's, who's older? Quark is older. Okay. Um. Yeah. So, yeah, we're, 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 we're going to get there. Don't you worry. We're going to get lots more of that. So... Uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was my best moment. Mike, I think it's time. You get some are they self-sealing? Hell yeah, they are oh, self-sealing. Yeah, they are. Here are some For who? For you. For you, Mike. For you. See what I did there, Keith? I did, I did. It's good TV. Um. All right, so let me start with the two things I think this episode actually does for me. Mm-hmm. Because I, for the most part, you know how I feel about that storyline. I, I think that's a big knock on the episode. I also think the pacing is very bad in this episode. It's it. I get, I think the comedic beats are fine. I think the Ferengi funny stuff is also pretty cool some of the time. But I think they belabored it a little bit here. The sitcom Three's company bits with the with the Grand Nagus and all of that go on for very long. It's 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 over yeah. half of the episode before we get to the MacGuffin, which leads to the the prophecies that and the resolution, which are are pretty. There are some interesting parts to them. Ultimately, we leave a lot of fruit on the tree, I think, because we don't know how he got the thing or how the interaction with the Bajorans went after the fact. And I do feel like trying to sell them at an exorbitantly Hold, hold one of their religious icon pieces, or what do you call them? Um, the uh, relics, yeah. As, yeah, oh, well, as sure. um, hostage financially is actually probably a pretty big, big deal politically, but we don't really deal with sure. that either. It's just a yeah. kind of a joke. But what I do think is effective here, and and maybe I'm overanalyzing, but I, I they did stick out to me were two things. One. And, and they all are in, remember we ta- I just was talking about how when plots intersect and compare themselves to each other, it can be effective, ask imp- in interesting questions. Going back to last week where we were talking, really kind of asking questions about religion and about how much religion is something that is our interpretation versus what we're shoehorning. Mm-hmm. So two things I noticed in this episode, I'm not gonna imply what I think it means, but I'm gonna say I, I don't think it was unintentional. One. The, the, they're called the wormhole aliens, is what we're calling them. Yeah, well, it's, it's the prophets. It's wormhole aliens to the Federation, yeah. the prophets to the Bajorans. They do behave in an omnipotent fashion. They, mm-hmm. in that they 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 have decided that they are the arbiter of how 
a being should be, right? Mm-hmm. They've yep. decided the Ferengi are not good in this current state, so they will alter them. And they have the power yep. to do so, which is interesting. Yeah, they they, they do not have the uh, uh, the, the uh, prime directive. Yes, correct. Yeah. That's to be noted. That is something yep. we, have, we are learning here. And I, what I think is interesting about that is that you could frame that very positively, right? You could say... Our, our God has decided that you, this is a sinful way of living for the Frankie. So yeah, we are going to yeah. make a miracle and make him better. He's like Lazarus. We're raising him from his existence and making him a new form. Or yeah. you could say, as, as Quark kind of says, not really, but maybe that's the, that this is the way we are. You shouldn't meddle with it. And it is, this is, you, that's interference. You shouldn't be doing that. None right? of your business. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I think that's interesting. That is something we've learned about the wormhole lands slash profits that I think is actually furtive and interesting moving forward. Also, and and this is one I'm interested to get your take because I might be overanalyzing it out of context with knowing how where things go. There was a big deal made last week about what what what, 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 what about Kira and the other Kai making. Cisco the emissary and the importance of the emissary mm-hmm. and the central like religious necessity of the emissary in all of their teachings and all of their everything's right. right the emissary right. is right. A, is the thing not once in this episode and we talked directly to God if you're Bajoran mm-hmm. do they say the word emissary they refer to him as the Cisco just like they refer to her as the Kira they refer to well, every- well, they they the the prophets never called him the emissary, right? Do they an emissary? Because I think the Bajorans. Ass- this gave is what him I'm saying. Title. What I'm saying is that there is a disconnect directly from what the Bajorans believe the importance of the emissary, the the religion they've created, versus from the horse's mouth. They don't refer to him yeah. as the emissary. They don't point out. I mean, he's important, but they don't they don't s- separate him from the rest of the, the cast members they're talking about in the episode at all. I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting uh, uh, saying something with by not saying it. Uh, just something I noted that stuck out to me because yeah. I kept waiting to say how they were going to, if they were interested in what the emissary said, and they don't even they don't even refer to him that way. So I thought that was an interesting thing. I think that those two things, well, what I took from this episode, I learned a little bit about the wormhole aliens. Yeah. Outside like, is- of that, the comedy worked up to a point and then got a little exhaustive for me. I also think it stepped on some of the more important beats we could have had. All in all, as you can tell, did not love. If we're using straight down the middle, the 50 from Sands last week, I don't think it's bad, but I can't give it more than 60 stem bolts. 60, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting about the, about the emissary thing. That's a, that's a really interesting point because like, is, is the emissary a title? Right, a position within the iconography of the religion or whatever it is, or is the emissary a role that somebody plays? And if it's as easy as just going into the wormhole and opening up the box to talk to these cats, why are we having an election for the Kai, right? Or for the, why don't we just well, we, go ask them? What's up? Who do you? Who is the next one? Well, I don't think they necessarily care about who the Kai is. Because that's that is the religion versus the, you know. Because like, does God care who the Pope is? Apparent. Well, according to the religion, he does. God is guiding what smoke comes up, right? So, it's a. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's a I chicken mean, or egg scenario. Well, well, th- this is where you get into the messiness and complexity of religion versus spirituality versus blah 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 blah. Right, which is why I think. It's not unintentional that they sh- there are discrepancies episode to episode about how much interaction or how much agency the wormhole aliens have to the religion. Well, and and you know agency is one and will is another. Yeah. Do they give a crap? Yeah. Do they not? Are they even aware of it? Are they not? And and you know that's that's always been the debate. I mean, you know, talk talk to a thousand different religions, they're going to have a thousand different answers for each of those pieces of it which is where it gets murky and i think a lot of the commenters you know especially those who are not religious are like well here's where you see the 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 mushiness of it all that can be exploited for this exploited for that for all sorts of good bad and ugly reasons um 
which is you know again the the muddiness of it the messiness of it that i is one of the things that i think deep space nine portrays well um all right but i gotta give stem bolts um yeah the 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 Bashir story <sighs> there's a story there that just didn't write it yeah right um there's there i, I can think of six different ways to make that an interesting and valid story. They just didn't do it. Um, even the point that I think they were trying to make, that it's just like people pretend they don't care, but they do, and people are get weird when something like that happens, just wasn't really told that well. Um, you know, the so the Ferengi part, the, the Ferengi comedy episodes, right? I think... Ferengi episodes are very difficult because it's a bit of a high, high wire act mm -hmm. because they are so extreme in their characterization, in the performances. I mean, like, Wallace Shawn's performance is a big swing. Yeah, that's fair. Right. <laughs> and so it is always on the razor's edge of being phenomenal or disastrous. Mm hmm. And the same thing with the way that we understand the Ferengi's way of life, their beliefs, their political beliefs, their, you know, the, the greed is good sort of a thing, that it's so extreme that you have to be really careful when you hold it up to any level of scrutiny because it, it's, it, it's so out there can easily be picked apart in like 10 seconds and the whole thing collapses. Um, so you're way out of the limb conceptually and you're also way out in the limb performance wise with the comedy so that when you're able to ride that razor's edge and it's successful, it's really fun. You know, like, like the episode we had, um, you know, with, with Quark and, and, and the, and the, the whole pants section of it. That was really fun. That was that was really cool. We learned something. It had some depth, had some complexity. 100%. Um, this one, I don't think was as successful because, because I think they didn't build the infrastructure to have it be, to have it stand up on its own two feet into like, you know, con conceptual, you know, which is why if, if what we're getting to is Quark making a defense of the Ferengi way of life. You know, it may not be for you, but here's why it works for us. Here's how it has some benefits. Like I said before, I'd love to hear that argument. I, you know, and and I I would love to have a true debate. You know, essentially capitalism versus socialism, right? It's what we're all sort of debating. It's 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 been it's been the humanity's existence for the last two hundred years, right? And I think there are great arguments on either side. So let's have it. Let's have that argument and try to arri arrive at something. And they just sidestep the whole idea. Yeah, because I think your point is really important, and I'll hit it again, because if you don't, we don't have to agree with it. In fact, it's better if we don't. But if they don't have a solid understanding of their motivation, of their why, of why it's important and why it's the way they their entire civilization is is built, then it becomes one-dimensional. Well, and and if your if your your goal is to try to be persuasive, it can't be a straw man argument, mm -hmm. right? You have the, the most persuasive argument gives weight and light to the other side, so that when you dismantle it, you're not just like you've actually dismantled something, as opposed to this weird caricature uh, or or whatever. Um, and so I think it's just, it's, it's a missed opportunity. I, I get it. They want to do something fun and light and whatever and do a comedy episode. Fine. That's, that's like, I, I don't have a problem with a comedy episode. I, I like the sort of structure of this. I'd love to find out what happens when the Negus interferes with the wormhole aliens and, and what they would do to try to fix that. I don't dislike the basic concept of it. Like they changed the Negus to completely believe the opposite of what he believes what are the consequences of that how does that spin out like i'm con this is an episode where my me i talk about a lot i have i have episodes where my memory of it isn't as good and then i watch it I'm like oh that's much better than my memory of the episode my memory of this episode of this episode is better than the actual watching of it 
because I think in my own head, in my memory, I rewrite it mm -hmm. to be a little bit better than it was because I like the idea. I like the what yeah, it's it's like almost a Freaky Friday episode. And, you know, we love a yeah. Freaky Friday. It's almost I, Freaky Friday. I love the what if of this, but the execution of it is not good. So uh, at the end of all of that, it gets 62 self-sealing oh, right stem there. bolts for okay. me. We're, we're real close and not that far off from the IMDb ranking, which ranks this episode 146 out of 173 episodes of Deep Space Nine with 67 self-sealing stem bolts. Mike, uh, pitch our other shows and our social media, will you? Keith, we do a lot on the internet. We start every week, Monday, 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 with k and Geekly, where we talk about, have you been watching any shows, movies, podcasts, stuff we find cool, and sometimes we talk about video games or whatever it might be. Sometimes we just chat. It's your chance. Keith and Mike Unfiltered. That's Mondays, k and Geekly. And then on Wednesdays, you get this show. We talk about Deep Space Nine every episode, every week. Try not to miss. You can help us join the team. Then, Keith... Friday's strange new show. Our patrons demanded it. We supplied it. We're going episode through episode through the newest Star Trek adventure, Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which just premiered its season two. And we are three quarters through season one. So we are getting geared up to join all of y'all watching season two. That's right. And we do the same thing. 90 minutes. We talk all about it. We give out our stem bolts. And then, of course, on Sundays, our flagship show, where it all started, Keith, we looked at Keith's toys, and then we started looking at your toys, customs, play sets, things people send us in the mail to review, all kinds of stuff, playmates, look at my Star Trek toys, that's on Sunday, and that's everything you get, unless you're a patron at patreon.com slash K&M, where there's so much, some would argue too much, more. <laughs> yes, so next week we are going to be talking about Visionary. There are only 10 more episodes Ooh. left in season three. We have some great ones coming up. Very excited. Uh, so Visionary is up next. We'll see you back here next Wednesday. Thank you so much for watching. Till then, this has been Keith and Mike. Watch Deep Space Nine. Thank you for watching k and Entertainment. If you enjoyed our particular brand of nonsense, please like and subscribe. Or become one of our patrons at patreon.com slash knm.